How cerebrospinal fluid circulates. Also known as CSF. circulates. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started on this page. Uh, what you're looking at is yet again a sagittal view of the brain, although <laughs> I've taken some liberties and uh, what you see here, this is of the lateral ventricle and then you see the other one behind it. So in our image we can see a little bit of the left and the right cerebral hemisphere. Okay, so first, let's outline uh, the lateral ventricles in blue. So let's try to follow along with me if you can. I know you can. Up, up, and over. So that's one lateral ventricle, and then do you see behind it, you I'm letting you look at a hint of the right lateral ventricle. Okay, so we'll use our blue pen to label these. The lateral ventricles. We always call them lateral ventricles, but I will also tell you that you can think of them as the first and second ventricles, and you'll see why that's helpful in a second. So cerebral spinal fluid is a fluid that fills uh, cavities inside of the brain, and those cavities are called ventricles. So you have cerebral spinal fluid, it's clear and watery, kind of like plasma, in four different ventricles, and then it also goes up and around the outside of the brain. And the purposes of CSF we can put right up here. Tell you right off the bat, we don't know all the functions of CSF, but we do know a couple of things for sure. Number one, it gives the brain buoyancy. The brain tissue, the neurons that make it up, is so fragile that without cerebral spinal fluid, it would crush under its own weight like a beached whale. So that's one important job. A second is cushion. For all those times those silly football players decide to smash each other's heads together. <laughs> I should point out that there have been a number of studies that show that all of those concussions that those football players get do lead to um, more uh, cases of early onset Alzheimer's or dementia, um, more cases of Parkinson's, etc. So Yes, you do have cushion for your brain, but that doesn't mean that you should be smashing your head into someone else's on a regular basis, unless they're going to pay you millions and millions of dollars a year and you decide it's worth it, like probably the NFL players have decided. And then a third role is communication. Uh, and this is an area of um, kind of uh, current research into what CSF does. It actually can, since it's going all around the brain, it's in a great position to uh, spread hormones that, that um, or paracrine signals um, that are going to tell different parts of the brain what to do. All right, so let's get back to then the spaces that the CSF is filling. It's uh, produced in capillary beds called choroid plexuses. Choroid means colored, and that's because these capillary beds look um, darkish or almost black when an um, autopsy is done, like clotted blood. And plexus means a network, so a network of colored capillaries. and they're in the roof of each ventricle. And 
and they produce the CSF. So if this is a capillary, like a pink blood vessel, and this is the ventricle, what happens is as the blood is coming um, through the capillary network, fluid and salts and things like that are forced into the ventricle. But the red blood cells and the white blood cells, of course, they stay in the capillary and just the fluid comes out. So CSF is similar, oops, wrong color, purple. CSF is similar to plasma. It's not identical and there are a lot of laboratory differences that doctors would uh, like to examine. But I think for our intents and purposes, if you can grasp that it's very similar to plasma, you're, you're doing pretty good basically blood without blood cells. It does not contain blood cells. So that makes it clear and clear colored. Almost like water. It has a little bit of a, a straw look to it though. All right, now we'll look at uh, another view of the lateral ventricles, but this is a different section. This is a transverse section or a superior look down, a superior view of the lateral ventricles. Can you see them? Here is one. And here is the other. And here are those capillaries that make the fluid. And the separation between the two sides, or the two ventricles at that point, is called the septum, meaning a wall, pellucidum and pellucidum means uh, clear to look at. Okay, so next up is the third ventricle. We're going to use a green highlighter for that. It's located around the thalamus. So if you're wondering where in the brain we're at. And there's some of it in the right hemisphere and some of it in the left hemisphere. And the two sides um, of the brain are connected with a little bit of tissue called an isthmus, like an island that connects the right and the left sides of the thalamus. And then there's a little bit of fluid in there, in this third ventricle. This is a narrow walled ventricle though. And give yourself a little bit of space because we're going to write something right here too. But here you can put third ventricle. And this is where people then ask, well where is the first and second? Well those are the lateral ventricles. Okay, and then we'll use orange for the, what number do you think this one is? fourth ventricle, and it's actually pretty big. It's bigger than it looks on this picture. You can't find my orange. Oh, here it is. So again, leave a little bit of space because we're going to write something right here. This is the fourth ventricle, and yet again, there's the choroid plexus hanging from the roof of it. Okay, so how does the fluid move? Well, it first moves through what are called the interventricular foramen. Sorry. And 
and then from the third ventricle to the fourth ventricle via the cerebral aqueduct. You, remember, you probably know an aqueduct is a channel for water, and so the cerebral aqueduct is a channel for cerebral spinal fluid through the brain from the third ventricle to the fourth ventricle. And that you can color in yellow here. And then it can exit, the cerebral spinal fluid can exit via apertures. Aperture just means like a window or an opening. And it has two options at this point. Can you guess? So if the fluid is in here, it started in the lateral ventricles, it drained to the third, it drained down to the fourth, and then it's going to exit, it can either go up and around the brain to give the outer parts of it buoyancy and cushion, or it can continue down the center, central canal of the spinal cord and down around the outsides of the spinal cord. And in this pathway, it goes in what's called the subarachnoid space. And we'll learn about those meninges and what they mean soon. So up and around the brain in the subarachnoid space, or down the central canal and outer areas of spinal cord. Actually, instead of doing that, we can put and the subarachnoid or the subdural it's sometimes called. Okay, so to recap, the um, cerebral spinal fluid is constantly being formed in the lateral ventricles, the third ventricle, and the fourth ventricle. It flows from the lateral ventricles down to the third ventricle, and from there down to the fourth ventricle, at which point it ex exits apertures. And just due to a little bit of pressure that's um, of the fluid, uh, some of that is going to be able to go up and all the way around the brain in the subarachnoid space, and some of it's going to go down the central canal and um, circulate in the subarachnoid space surrounding the spinal cord. We'll get to this a little later too, but if someone has a lumbar puncture, they're removing some of the CSF from that region. Okay, so then what happens to it though is that it has to get um, reabsorbed uh, at one place or another. One of the places is at the top of the head. So reabsorbed in uh, the sinuses. And I don't mean your nasal sinuses, I actually mean blood sinuses, places that are filled with blood at the top and um, between the um, cerebrum and the cerebellum too. We'll look at that in a second. And then we now know that some of the fluid that goes down and around the spinal cord is reabsorbed into blood vessels. At near the bottom of the spinal cord and around the spinal nerves. So one way or another it has to get reabsorbed because if it doesn't get reabsorbed, then hydrocephaly can occur. So if there's a blockage, which could be caused by a tumor or trauma, or it could just be like in the case of a baby, a congenital or a um, developmental mistake, So any of those reasons, then um, hydrocephaly can occur. You can see right in the name, 
Hydro means water. Cephaly means head. It's like water on the head. And in an adult, uh, that can cause a lot of brain damage. And in a child, it, it can as well. But uh, luckily, because their skull bones aren't fused, uh, their their head will expand in size. But at least then the neurons are not being squashed. Uh, and then at some point, they'll have to correct that. Okay, I'm going to stop there, and then we'll pick up on a few more things on this page in the next video.